what we're specifically going to be demonstrating today is instantaneous dynamic range and speed as well as the um, spur suppression capability of the M9393 and 89601B uh, vector signal analysis software. There are two M9381A vector signal generators. Each is going through an isolator and then into a power combiner, and, the, and then both signals are being driven through the power combiner, and the summed signal is being driven into the input of the M9393A vector signal analyzer. The vector signal analyzer is being controlled by the 89601B software, and specifically with the option SSA, which stands for Stepped Spectrum Analysis, which is a new option that's now available in the uh, 89601B uh, vector signal analysis software. Basically, it enables us to use the stepped uh, capability of the vector signal analyzer to do stepped spectrum analysis. So now we can do wide sweeps across uh, uh, large spans of spectrum very fast. Okay, so what we're looking at now is the desktop of the controller for the PXI chassis that has uh, both of the uh, M9381 sources as well as the M9393 vector signal analyzer. And all of this software is running on an embedded controller in that chassis. So what we're looking at here are the soft front panels that control the two vector signal generators. So uh, they're both currently turned off. You can see the RF is not on. So what we're looking at then on screen here for the SSA is we are sweeping from 100 megahertz to 3.6 gigahertz in a 3 kilohertz resolution bandwidth. So that's a very narrow resolution bandwidth. The result is that, as you can see, the noise floor is below minus 100 dBm. So the bottom of screen is minus 110. This graticule right here is minus 100. So very good noise performance, and most importantly, the ability to sweep very fast, even in a very narrow resolution bandwidth. So you can see down here there's an indicator that estimates the actual sweep rate, and you can see that it's roughly around 3.6 to 3.7 gigahertz per second, again, even in a 3 kilohertz resolution bandwidth. Now I'm going to turn the sources on. So first off, I'll turn on the low power source. So you can see I have that tuned at 2.75 gigahertz, and marker 2 is set at that peak. What I've done is I've set the output power of that generator to deliver about minus 80 dBm at the input of the VSA. So I've compensated for the loss through the system by increasing the output power slightly. Now I'm going to turn on the strong power source. Again, I've set the power to 4.7 with my goal being to deliver 0 dBm at the input of the vector signal analyzer. So now you can see a couple of things. One is marker 1 is set to that frequency, and you can see that the value is very close to 0 dBm. So I've got one signal going in at 0 dBm and another signal going in at minus 80 dBm. You can also see that the, the, the broadband noise of the sources is raising the noise floor here. But again, it's still down around minus 100 dBm. So um, very solid uh, broadband noise performance, but you can see that broadband noise of the sources. Now, the key thing to note here is that I have one signal going in at 0 dBm, and I'm still very accurately measuring, well above the noise floor, another signal at minus 80 dBm. Now, if you look at the settings that I'm using, I have my range, or sometimes in other analyzers referred to as reference level, set to plus 2 dBm. And another nice feature of the SSA software is that it's able to decouple the top of the display from the range. So I've actually got my top of display set at minus 10 dBm, and the reason that I've done that is so that I can show just how low the noise floor is. So the bottom of screen is at minus 110 dBm. Now what I'm going to do is um, show the effect of the uh, spur suppression capability that we have implemented 
in, uh, in the software and the firmware of the receiver. So as with all uh, superheterodyne receivers, there are spurs, those that are present when there's no input are referred to as residuals, and those that are present specifically when there is an input signal are typically referred to as input-related spurs. So all receivers and analyzers have these spurs, and all of them utilize various techniques in order to suppress those spurs. So I'm going to demonstrate our capability to do that. And you might ask, well, why would I ever operate in a, in a situation where I'm not suppressing the spurs? Well, the spur suppression techniques do require additional processing and additional data capture that does slow it down somewhat. You can see it's still extremely fast, but it can be even faster when we turn those techniques off. So we provide the flexibility to operate in, in both ways. So... What I'll do now is I'll come in here. This is the control panel that basically controls all of the, the, the spectrum analysis uh, capability of the SSA software. So you can see up here we have start and stop frequency. We can also do that in terms of center and span. So you can see I'm starting at 100 megahertz and going to 3.6 gigahertz. And then we've got our resolution bandwidth and video bandwidth controls here. Uh, again, you can see the 3 kilohertz setting. Uh, I can choose my window type. I can choose uh, the type of averaging that I use for video bandwidth. Um, and then we come down here in the detector section. So I have a number of different choices for detectors, and I can actually apply multiple detectors as well. And then I can control one of the another nice feature of the SSA software is I can actually control the number of display points that I want to use. And then at the very bottom down here is settings we refer to as the conversion settings. And these control our ability to do image protection and spur suppression and so forth. So the thing I want to focus on now is a spur suppression technique that we refer to as IF frequency dither. What we do is we basically use the driver and the software to control the IF frequency and we move it around in a somewhat random fashion in order to suppress our internally generated spurs. So now I'm going to turn that off and you can see that, oh, lo and behold, there comes up some, some internally generated spurs. One of the things some people worry about under these types of conditions is, oh, well, I affect my ability to measure uh, my other spurs. But you can see that the marker is still on the, the external spur from that other source. Now, it is moving around a little bit as, as the noise floor has come up a little bit. Uh, the IF frequency dither does apply some averaging, so that has, has reduced the noise floor somewhat. Well, and this is a pretty reasonable spur environment, and you can see that we're still able to effectively measure that, that low-level spur down there at minus 80. Well, as with most receivers or most analyzers of this type of an architecture, when you put signals in at sub-multiples of the first IF, that is a particularly problematic spur area. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tune the strong signal to 2.559 gigahertz, and you'll see that the spur environment comes up significantly. So basically what this is, I'm putting a signal in directly at half of the first IF frequency, and that is causing um, significant internally generated spurs. But it's important to note that the external spur, the real spur coming from the outside that is part of the device under test, is still being measured effectively. Now, one of the things that some people concern themselves with in terms of techniques like this, they think that if you have an external signal that's at the same frequency as one of your internally generated spurs, and then you cancel that internally generated spur, you cancel the external signal as well. I'm now going to show you that that actually is not the case. So I'm going to bring up another marker. I'm going to add marker 3. And I'm going to use marker 3 to tell me where this, this internally generated spur, the strongest internally generated spur, is actually at 2.678333 gigahertz. So I am now going to tune the low-level signal to that frequency. So 
So now you'll see marker 2 drop down to the noise because I moved the signal. Now that signal is directly under that internally generated spur. And so we, we can't see the external uh, signal at this point in time. And now if we come back over here and we turn the IF frequency dither back on, now you can see the internally generated spurs are removed and the uh, marker 3 is directly on that the external signal, the signal that is coming from the second source. And uh, you can see that it is still accurately measuring the, the signal from that signal source around minus 80 dBm. So the key point here is that in the presence of a strong signal, we can still measure a very low level signal. And we're able to uh, deliver a very, very good spur-free performance by um, utilizing our technique for suppressing our internally generated spurs. Um, you can see in this particular display, we have uh, over 100 dB of, of spur-free range uh, utilizing this technique. So that's, uh, that's the conclusion of the demo for today.